We also were a program of the Center for Nonprofit Strategy and Management at Brew College School. Well, I need to give the full name because I get fined if I don't say it by the donor. <laughs> of the Austin W. Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Brew College, the City University of New York. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have a number of guests here tonight. These leadership conversations we have, we've had them for eight years since our inception. We probably have had close to 50. And this is one of the most popular, as you can see, where it's a conversation for us to have with people who are working for uh, long periods of time in many cases uh, of, to talk about how we can bridge the divide that's sometimes perceived between funders and, and grants, grant partners, grantee partners, as we would, we would say. Um, and so uh, just to know you up front, uh, I personally curated most important publications that you could read, and they're on the back table. Now, I don't want you to think that I had any ego going by put my book, <laughs> Securing Organization's Future, because this review, to, it's called The Cookbook of Fun Everything You Need to Know About Fundraising. And the good news is, well, the good news is publishers out of business, but as a used copy, you can get it on um, uh, on Amazon uh, for one, two to five dollars. So it's a good a good deal. And one of the readings you had was the chapter on foundations, right, Sean? We, we yes. have that, yeah. So give give you that details. So let me. Um, I want you to join me in giving a very warm welcome to our incredible host, Daria. Hi, everyone. My name is Derek Hagan. I am your host tonight at Amalgamated Bank. Just wanted to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here for this incredible conversation. I uh, wanted to give a brief history for those of you who might not know, although I know we have some clients in the room tonight. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know who you are. <laughs> so Amalgamated actually turned 100 years old this year. We were founded during a really interesting time uh, by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union when some of the larger banks were not interested in banking folks that they didn't consider worthy of having bank accounts. So the labor union then created the bank to serve these amazing individuals who are part of the union. We've grown since then, uh, of course, to serve the entire labor movement, as well as many types of folks who are learning for this conversation, nonprofits and foundations. So we feel very uniquely honored to host you all tonight. Um, a few quick housekeeping items. If you need water, there's a kitchen sort of out there towards the end of the hallway with water, the restrooms down that hallway. There is a table at the back with the incredible books and items curated, of course, but also has a, a little bit of swag from Amalgamated to say thanks for being here. And my business card, why would you want to take that? Number one, if you do need Wi-Fi, you can join AB Guest, and then you put my email address in there, and I'll give you Wi-Fi. So that's number one. And number two, if you want to learn more about Amalgamated. I think that's it for oh, me. Space. 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 Oh, oh, I did say that. <laughs> <clears throat> One more reason to take the card. Wow, amazing. Great. Um, this is a free conference space. If you would like it, just email me and I'll see if it's free. And then we'll come give the same pitch at your event, which you can look forward to. Thanks for being no, here. Don't leave yet. Oh. Oh, uh, I'm one of the people that the nonprofit I'm on the board of has an account at Amalgamated, well, the Bowie Peace Africa Foundation USA. And, you know, we uh, talk the talk, walk the talk, buy the talk, and use the talk. So as some of our fellows know, support an organization in Nairobi where they provide employment for women and men who need a source of livelihood uh, to turn flip-flops you heard this flip flops <laughs> into gifts. And they make the flip flops from, um, what, I'm sorry, they make the products through the flip flops left on the beach, mm -hmm. uh, and which way they go into the water, they're not biodegradable. Mm -hmm. And you were presenting you with four. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I hand it over to Surya, I just thought I'd give you some statistics, and but she'll correct me if I'm wrong, because you have more current statistics, if you will, of 
we are currently uh, have more than 100,000 foundations in the United States, right so far, and 9,000 in the five boroughs. Oh, good, I'm not so far off. My data is not so far off. And so we are the largest concentration of foundations uh, probably in the world. We're not the largest in assets because, you know, there's some people out in Seattle called Gates Foundation. <laughs> uh, but we're ever present. And if you ever want me to take you a walking tour of their footprint throughout the city, I'm, ha I'm happy to do that because it really is remarkable. And the uh, just some basics so you know that we're uh, foundations is a general term includes independent foundations such as the Ford Foundation, includes public foundations uh, such as the North Star Fund, includes community foundations uh, as uh, both Rachel and Pat from the trust. It includes corporate foundations. 50% 50, 50 of uh, corporations do their giving through a corporate foundation, American Express Foundation, Avon, oh, and then their operating foundations which is uh, our beloved local fund for the city of New York, which is both uh, technical assistance, doing many things, but also is, is a grant making body. And so the issues that generally come up are like, how can I get a grant? Which some of you mentioned, how do I get my foot in the door? Um, also uh, issues around general support versus project support. Uh, multi-year support, these are all bread and butter issues, as I know, all of, all of us face. But we also want to look tonight to create an opportunity to talk about those things, but also talking about some of the innovation that's been going on. Uh, I know you're in high find it's hard to believe, but I entered the foundation world in 1969, and I've had and I've been either your side or their side, well, but back on your side, seeking mm -hmm. grants. And we had uh, so I've known the field since 69, that's what, over 50 years practically. Uh, and it's one thing I will say, and I think our speakers will say the same, same right now. This has been the most fluid time in the life of foundations than we've ever seen. There's more experimentation. There's more uh, efforts to go to work outside the box. There are more efforts to in kind of increase promote accountants, accountability and transparency. And you're all going to get a, an, art, some, an article on that subject that I co-authored. So it's an exciting period. Um, Rachel, you, I have a phrase for what you said to me. But oh, I said, if you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. <laughs> <laughs> we all say that. <laughs> it's not just me. <laughs> I didn't come up with it. But it's true. Is It's... Um, we can try to generalize, but the fact of the matter is, you can't imagine. I'll just tell you one quick story. You know, family foundations are very in the city. I don't know whether the majority of foundations are probably family foundations in the city. What? Oh, okay, I think they are. So to tell you just a, a peek on the creativity in the foundation world, uh, when I was president of philanthropy in New York, I had a visitor from the Boston Family Foundation with a husband and the wife, and there were no staff or whatever. And I said, and they were just getting off the I said, well, uh, what are you about? And they said, well, we commissioned research. I said, okay, I got my attention. Yeah. That there is a connection between, in the household, between abuse of animals and domestic abuse. Yeah. And two, they, none of the two meet. So they started a grant-making program to bring those involved with ASPCA, other animal rights organizations, and those fighting domestic violence, and to introduce them to each other, and and begin to begin to uh, learn from each other's efforts and work together. So, it's we probably with nine thousand nine thousand uh, foundations in New York. We probably in New York City. I can't begin to imagine how many grants that could be. It could be anywhere from twenty to fifty thousand a, a year. Uh, so. This is to open up your eyes a little bit more. And before we start, I just want to see a show of hands. Uh, how many uh, How many of you have written proposals? Oh, good, okay. Uh, how many of you are in the development institutional advancement or what I call the resource mobilization world? Yay, okay, wonderful. You're all in the right, right place. Uh, we were so overwhelmed with the turnout here that uh, we're going to send you some resources afterwards. 
because the uh, I personally teach this course starting in in February at Baruch as a master's degree course. So we have tons of materials, and we and last but not least, some of you have. Uh, can I ask our fellows, past and present, to stand up? Where where are you? Hey, let's get all all up. Hi. So uh, the New York Community Trust and its wisdom uh, created this program nine years ago, and Pat was our program officer at the time. Because let, let me see if I can say this properly. All right, because they realized there was a huge generation change happening in the leadership of nonprofits across the country, especially in New York. My generation, the baby boomers, are retiring, except yours truly, <laughs> and that the new generation is more like the both it matches more the demographics of our incredible city where i tell my students they can't use the word minority because you're in the new majority and and so we set out so we set out to design programs there are programs like this but often they're for the executive directors and it was the the wisdom of the trust that this would be for emerging leaders and uh, as you can, you've talked to if you talk to any of the ones here you can see their great stories uh, how have they provided? So, if you're interested in more information about the program, uh, Leadership Fellows New York, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. And I think I will now send it, hand it over to Surya. And again, uh, we're so thrilled to see you all. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael, for the great introduction and context for where we are in New York City. As Michael said, not all foundations are the same. So this conversation is with some unique foundations who have will share their perspective, um, but there might be some general learnings you can take from that. Um, so my name is Supriya Kumar. I use she, her pronouns. I'm with Candid. For those of you who don't know Candid, you might actually know Candid because we were formed in 2019 when Foundation Center and GuideStar came together uh, to become one organization. Um, our mission is to help other nonprofits and foundations do the work you do uh, for the social sector. So we gather, organize, and make sense of philanthropic data. Um, with that data, we provide trainings for nonprofits so that you can, you know, learn how to write grant proposals that are better and, you know, using the data we have to make more informed decisions and access foundations that are supporting the work you do. At the same time, we also provide that those resources to foundations so that they can make more informed decisions uh, in their grant making. Um, what was that? I will pass my, one more thing, yes. And I'm a fellow, yes, I'm a current fellow. <laughs> 2023 cohort, yes, thank you, Michael. That's why I've been tasked to do this. <laughs> um, I guess I'll pass the mic around um, so you can all introduce yourselves, and I'll provide some context of while you're here, and then we'll jump into some questions. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Just do this. Everyone can hear me. Okay. Um, my name is Rachel Pardo, and I am a senior program program officer at the New York Community Trust here in New York City. Um, we are a the city's community foundation, or a community foundation in the city. There are many of them now. Uh, we're one of the oldest and the largest, uh, and we're actually celebrating our centennial in 2024, which is very exciting. We have a huge slate of programs, so keep watch for everything that's going to happen. Very exciting things. I can't give a bite. It's going to be very exciting. Um, we have kind of two sets of funding. Um, I work in the competitive grant side. I, as I said, I'm a senior program officer and I oversee um, grant making for older adults, people with disabilities, animal welfare, and, tech, and technical assistance. I think I got everything there. It's a hodgepodge. Um, so on the competitive grant side, we make about $10 million in grants. And then we also have a donor advised fund side um, that does their own grant making. We do a little bit of overlap with them, but generally um, don't do a lot of uh, hand-holding or pushing our donors to go one way or the other. Um, on the competitive grant side, it's a team of about 15 program officers and staff. Um, I've been at the Trust for about 10 years, 2015, my 10 year anniversary. So that's me. There you go. Got that one. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming out. My name is Jen Chang, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm having some, some mic. Okay, anyway, you can hear me. It's fine. You can probably hear me without the mic, but anyway. Um, uh, I have the privilege of running an organization called North Star Fund, and there are some folks here who have a longer history of North Star Fund than I. 
Um, North Star Fund is a very unusual foundation. Um, we are a public social justice fund. And we were founded over 40 years ago by a group of New Yorkers who came together after the municipal crisis in New York. These New Yorkers were coming into inherited wealth and actually didn't want to replicate what they saw was happening in standard philanthropy. And so they developed North Star Fund in a really radical and amazing generation of uh, turning philanthropy on its head. Funds like ours were seeded throughout the country, really throughout the world in some situations. Um, and we are known for two things. One is we mobilize resources. So we are fundraisers just like you. Here's my tin cup, tin cup, tin cup. Um, and what we do is we raise money and then we move those dollars back into the community control of organizers who are working on the very issues that they've identified as unjust. Um, we also are organizers ourselves. So we organize within philanthropy and with peers, allies, individual donors, foundations to really try and disrupt and change the traditional patterns of how money moves within the nonprofit system. And the work that we support is interdisciplinary, um, but we do only, the organization itself since its founding has really only supported grassroots organizing work. So work that is led um, by individuals who are most directly impacted by whatever change they're seeking um, to reforms or uh, structural changes or systems change that they seek. And um, we currently work uh, within the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, as well as the counties leading up from Westchester all the way through to Albany in the Hudson Valley. Um, we are, as a public fund, um, designed like many community foundations. So we have a grant-making side that is in the control of our volunteer community funding committees that supports geographic work in New York City and the Hudson Valley. And we also have one of the country's largest Black activist-led funds for Black-led organizing, fighting for Black liberation. That fund was founded after the murder of Eric Garner um, and is designed not only to address issues of police and community justice reform, but larger issues of communities defining safety as they see fit. Um, the only other thing that I'll add is that we also have things like donor advice funds. And what we try and do is we really work with individual donors um, and really ask them to really change and think about how they're giving. So some of the questions that you all raised tonight, like why aren't people making multi-year gifts? Why aren't are there more general operating grants? This is the type. This is the type of pedagogical and discipline work that we do with our giving community to try and um, really change and transform their relationship with money and control. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hello. <laughs> um, my name is Eric Lee. I am from the Ford Foundation, specifically the Office of Strategy and Learning. Um, and uh, I have to say that I'm a little bit different from uh, some of these the other speakers, my fellow speakers on on this panel, in that I am not a uh, grant maker in the traditional sense. Um, as part of the Office of Strategy and Learning, our role is to support our programs in developing their program strategies that help guide uh, their grant making, as well as developing their monitoring, evaluation, and learning strategies so that they can track progress uh, towards their outcomes that they're hoping to achieve. So that's my day-to-day -day role. Um, but my grant making is actually through what we for, uh, call the Good Neighbor Committee. And that is an internal initiative at the Ford Foundation that was uh, created with two aims in mind. The first one is uh, the Ford Foundation makes lots of grants across the United States and around the world, but we also wanted to make sure that we demonstrated our commitment to our neighborhood and being a good neighbor. And originally that meant Midtown Manhattan. Um, so grant making locally in Midtown Manhattan. Thankfully that has since expanded to all five boroughs. So uh, we made grants uh, in all five boroughs. And the second aim really was to um, provide an opportunity for staff at Ford like myself who don't have um, a regular grant making role uh, the opportunity to, to make grants in that sense. So um, anything I say with regards to grant making tonight, I have to put a huge asterisk next to it uh, because I'm coming at this from the lens of being part of this uh, Good Neighbor Committee, which 
does have a lot of similarities to Ford's general grant making, but because its purpose is very different from Ford's general grant making, uh, there are some major differences as well. Um, so some things I say uh, may or may not apply to Ford more broadly, um, but they do apply in, in our little corner of Ford, the Good Neighbor Committee. So grant us. Oh, uh, so as part of, yes, as part of the Good Neighbor Committee, um, we focus on four areas, the first being arts and culture, uh, education, human services, and the fourth being uh, leadership development. And it is through that leadership development that we provided a grant uh, to this program. So, and that is how, <laughs> how, how we came to be here, so yeah. And you were our first new funder, and the second new funder was the Fund for the City of New York. Happy, happy, to, happy to do that. <laughs> Hi, greetings, greetings, everybody. I'm Pat Swan, and I am a colleague of Rachel's uh, for the next 26 days. Uh, <laughs> know that? I'm, I'm actually in... Um, semi-retirement and so I had been at the working at the trust for almost 24 years and as a, as a program officer my responsibilities there included uh, civic affairs technical assistance uh, community development and I think that's it and um, so I won't I won't say a whole lot more about New York Community Trust because Rachel's covered a lot of it um, I did before coming to the trust I was a nonprofit uh, professional and have worked, spent most of my career, aside from a few years in government, um, working on that side of the table. And so I'm just really pleased to be a part of this amazing panel. Um, everybody's already said this, I'll say it one more time, every foundation is different. Um, and even within the foundations, oftentimes you'll find different uh, departments, different units, different personalities in terms of the program officers and the people who are responsible for grant making. Um, I just am looking forward to being able to share as much as I can tonight. And um, as I've often said to Michael, this is really, this program is one of the things I'm most proud of, proud of in terms of uh, my, my 20 plus year career in philanthropy. And so I'm just really glad to um, to see everybody here. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces. So um, my pleasure. Covered everything. Anything else? Yes. just mentioned there the 500 plus fellows currently. The what? The 500 fellows currently. 500. 500. <laughs> there are 500 fellows. Michael tells me at this point. I haven't kept track of every single one. So um, that number actually amazes me because I can remember when we started this program. Um, and I will say that I am so um, just very, very lucky that um, the amazing Rachel Pardo is taking over the technical assistance part of my grant portfolio and is now the program officer um, responsible for this program among her many other hats that she wears at the That's trust. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, so the 500 fellows and then a network that's even much broader than that. Yes, yes, and we're, we're, uh, <clears throat> we both, uh, we're currently as some fellows from the current cohort. And then of course, for those of you who are interested, uh, our next cohort starts in October. Just one more thing to mention about the fellows, the, um, the fellowship program, I just wanted to note that we also funded an evaluation, which is currently happening now. Um, so a second one, you're right, because we did one back in 2016 or something like that. Um, this is um, a little bit of a, of a different uh, aim in that it's, you have 500 fellows and you have a huge network, you've been doing this for 10 years. So that's happening now, and the evaluator is, you know, starting to frame the survey and other types of data collection activities. So you should be, you may, may be hearing from her, if you're a fellow, you may be hearing from her um, in the next several months. She's great. She also used to work at the Trust as a fellow, so she's fantastic. Great. And then Michael did remind me that we also want to welcome the folks who are joining virtually. We do have a Zoom connection, so hello everyone who's virtual. Thanks for joining in. 
All right. So yeah. the way we're going to, the agenda is going to go is we're going to have some of the panelists answer a few questions, and then we're actually going to break out into smaller groups so you get to connect with them in um, real small groups. Um, so we'll get started on the tough questions. Um, so a lot of these questions were also contributed from the folks who are attending. So thank you so much who sent those questions in advance. Um, one of the big things people want to know is, well, how do grantee partners actually get connected with funders and how do we build those relationships? So if you can share a little bit about how you connect with grantee partners and any advice you would give grant seekers. So it's, uh, it's very, as uh, Michael said, Michael said, you know one foundation, you know one foundation, you know one program officer, you know one program officer. So um, if I should speak for myself and that I am always willing to have a conversation. I actually just put a little scheduler on my signature so you can even just click on that and get some time on my calendar. I'm not gonna be able to come out to see the organization because if I did that, I would spend all my time traveling around the city, which would be fantastic, but I wouldn't be able to get anything else done. So ultimately, I'm willing to have a half hour conversation and just hear what you're doing. I can, if it's a definitive no, this just does not fit, I will tell you. But outside of that, it's very hard for me to say, oh, yeah, we can, you know, make a recommendation or not. If it there, if it's kind of on the line that it might be something, I would say put in a proposal because we have an open application process and we have, we make grants all year round. Um, so ultimately, the first step is have that very brief conversation just to hear whether it's an absolute no, if it's outside of our guidelines, it's outside of New York City, and then put in a proposal because we don't have one of those um, like fill-ins, which during COVID we had to actually apply for a lot of funding from foundations and that drove me crazy that like I had my kids screaming in the background, I'm trying to fill in the blanks. We don't do that. We just ask for a narrative and it's up to 10 pages, so it's pretty open. So we try to not make it a burden for organizations to submit something and then at least having it in our system, then we can go forward and have visits and conversations and really. Yeah, you have one of the best web, uh, websites in terms of access. You think so? Yes. Yeah, so I, I Michael said we have one of the finest websites in terms of access. I would argue that's not the case, but it's gotten better. But information we, for applicants. Information for applicants. So we've done a lot of work. I can actually say that I've kind of pushed that. We've done a lot of work trying to make um, as accessible information as possible. So we have it written, we have videos, we have, we used to do kind of uh, meet the program officers, we have open open office hours. So we're trying to make it as accessible through, through various ways. Now, again, you know, one program officer, officer, you know, one program officer, some of my colleagues are very open to that, others it's a lot harder. And often it has to do with the fact that some of the program areas are bigger than others. So they just get so much more proposed, so many more proposals coming in. So it's just really a matter of time management and they can't have those conversations because again, all they'd be doing is having conversations and not actually writing up the board recommendations. Um, so yeah, did I did I get everything, Pat? Okay. okay. Um, one, one, one more. <laughs> not, not to be, um, you know, a Debbie Downer, but I do think an important point of context um, is to say that in any typical year, the New York Community Trust, and again, every foundation is different, but we get, I'm going to guess roughly about a thousand proposals. And so, huh? It's like 1,500 now. 1,500. And so, and there are about eight or nine people that are responsible for reading and reviewing and making recommendations on those proposals. So just to give you, you know, to put some context to what Rachel's saying that, I also would have loved to be able to just spend my time going out and meeting all the amazing people that are doing good work in New York City, um, but it's just not possible. But so just wanted to add that little bit of context. Um, before I share with you all a little bit about the specifics of North Star Fund itself, I thought that I could just um, talk a little bit about this question more generally. I, I can give you, I am now uh, over six years at North Star Fund. It is my first job in the field of formal philanthropy, although we have a little bit of a foot in both doors as a resource mobilizer. Um, but I was for many years on this side and, um, you know, I've got all the gray hairs to attest to it. Um, I've worked in human services and legal services, civil rights, immigrants' rights, organizing, 
um, government and I've raised money for all of those spaces. So I know the challenge. And I would say I had a little bit of a matrix moment. So I knew the information of what I thought philanthropy was on the outside. And then once stepped inside, I would say I had a little, I had my little bit of neo awareness and awakening. <laughs> um, but certain things really do hold true. The first is it's very overwhelming to raise money in New York. Many of us have boards and colleagues who are always like, I saw this. Why didn't we get this money? Why didn't we get that money? Why didn't we get this money? How come no one's get that money? <laughs> right? Like you're just like walking steeped in wealth, and we don't understand why our organizations are not accessing any of it. So I would say first, take a very deep breath. Yes. A lot of the information you need to grow your revenue exists already within your organization. And I can't say this enough. Raising money is all about building relationships, and you are all working in organizations that have some level of relationships. And the best place to start is either with institutions or individuals who are currently funding you, relationships that your staff may hold, um, and relationships amongst your peer and ally organizations with whom you may think about fundraising together, right? Pull it in together and try the very first grant I ever got from the New York Community Trust through Pat Swan, I don't think she's even going to remember, um, was with six other community-based organizations together. And one of them had the contact and we thought, well, why, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, let's try and go in together and then we can all sort of build relationships anew. So I always recommend to folks to first talk to your colleagues, your boards, really assess who has historically funded you, where are their potential relationships? Use those relationships as a wedge to get in the door and try to have a conversation. Like you did fund us five years ago for this. It was before I maybe I started here, but I'm really curious about why you fund. You know, like those are there are ways to just get an understanding. I think it's very challenging sometimes for program officers to have to field an out of the blue call, yeah. and it is really better when there's maybe a little bit more of a history and a nuanced understanding of what the portfolio might have looked like in the past. Um, the other thing that I would say is you really take advantage of programming like through spaces like Candid or Philanthropy New York or Nonprofit New York, entities that are doing a lot of work to bring funders into space with the nonprofit sector, um, not just for the networking and the relationship building, but for the landscape assessment. Many times when I was on the, and even now, I would be at a meeting and I would always meet a funder that like I never knew existed, right? That's one of the really strange yes. things about New York. I'll be like, I had they were like, we are a seven hundred year old foundation that's been funding this work here, and I'd be like, no, you are not. I don't have to do that, right? But that's the beauty of the volume of potential resources and resource mobilization in New York. And then the third thing that I would say, I think, is which is just the sort of you know. I would just hold out to all of you as my own personal experience. Fundraising is a very tricky thing for me. I'm a woman of color raised by immigrants who desperately wanted me in a, in a role where I would not have to rely on other people for money because we grew up with financial insecurity. And so I have mixed feelings about fundraising. And I think really just leaning into those feelings and um, just being clear about what it is that you are raising money for. Um, we all have a tendency, especially in the city of New York and the state of New York, where we often have to design for those of us who receive public proposals, um, public funding, we sort of have to take our triangle program and make it into a circle and then take that circle and put whipped cream on it. You know, like we have to do everything we can to kind of get the dollars in the door. But when you're fundraising from foundations or individual donors or philanthropic sectors or donor, you know, people holding donor advised funds or corporate foundations, like that's really your chance to sing the work and the mission, what you are really trying to build. And as Michael said earlier, we are in a really sea shifting time in the sector of philanthropy where um, coming off of multiple crises, Funders have experimented and tried different ways to fund. And now it's really incumbent, I think, on the sector to not just immediately go back to a supplicant role and be like, whatever, however you want to give that money, whatever money you want to give, I'm good. Just, you know, like, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we can say thank you. And the fact that you gave me unrestricted gifts during COVID, you know, we would really love to continue because that enabled us to be nimble and to shift the program. Or thank you. And the fact that we are three years out of the racial justice reckoning of 2020 and most of that money is drying up means people we hired now don't have work. How are you going to be accountable to us? Like there is a space for us to talk peer to peer about the sustainability of our work right now as funders truly are listening. 
And funders are not only listening, now on the neo matrix side, I would say funders do a lot of talking to each other. We just yeah. love it. We just talk, 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 talk all the time. We love to get together, little breakfast cheeses and things like that, and share information. So when you talk to one funder, always ask them, is there another community, a space, a network? You know, because there are spaces that people can help bring, even if you're not a match, right? They could send an email. They could potentially call a colleague or let you know of a particular meeting coming up. So um, there's a space for us to be utilizing the le and leveraging the relationships that we have um, in the best ways possible. That doesn't require us to just wholesale swallow, um, you know, the things that we think are required to, to close a deal. I just wanted to add, m many of you, I think, are probably familiar with Giving USA, Giving USA Foundation, and their estimates roughly uh, are $450 billion is given to nonprofit organizations in a given year. And what's very interesting is, so 80% of that is from individuals, roughly, uh, no, I say 75%, then uh, corporate giving as charitable giving has gone down, although marketing giving has increased, I wouldn't call it giving. But so foundations are 20% of that charitable pie. We're the most visible, and it's easier to go to a foundation than go to Mr. Bloomberg in many cases, or other, other individual donors. But we need, just supporting what you said, we need to keep in mind that we have to diversify our funding beyond the foundation world. And I have to apologize, I didn't tell you at all how North Star Fund works, but we're super transparent on, on our website. Um, and uh, I'm happy to share any, you know, folks have an interest in our, our funding mechanisms. So I'm just gonna you know, echo everything that was just said about the importance of um, relationships and leveraging uh, prior donors and using those relationships. I will say that at Ford, uh, the process varies from program to program. Um, but what I really like about the Good Neighbor Committee is that we, because we are not uh, guided by a program strategy in a sense that our regular program teams are, we have a lot more flexibility. So we do accept uh, letters of inquiry. So on our website, the, the email address is facing it right now, but um, on our website, at the board website, there is an email address that you can send a letter of inquiry. And I believe that's how- um, well, I knew about you way back when, remember? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and so you can uh, submit your letter of inquiry that way. Um, so uh, yes, but echoing everything that was just said, I really don't have any more to ask. Can I, can I add something? One other thing, when I, so I also came from the nonprofit world and did a lot of grant seeking and fundraising. And I was terrified of the foundations. I was terrified of the foundation staff. I remember my program officer at Robinhood, I thought he was like, God. Um, and- uh, We'll unpack that later. Well, yeah. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't think I quite realized that at least the kind of professionals within philanthropy, they are all non, they con I consider myself a nonprofit professional, maybe, a those on the grant seeker side don't, but I consider myself a nonprofit professional. I want to make the city great. I want to do the same thing that you're doing, but just on a different, through through a different mechanism, through a different strategy. So that being said, I think this formality, I, I hate it. This formality and this sense of this power dynamic between foundations and grant seekers. And I want to try to get rid of that. So I just like make jokes on the call and just try to be as easygoing as possible. So ask, all you've got to do is ask, ask if we know other funders who are doing this work, mm -hmm. ask, you know, for support, getting your campaign out. You know, I could put it on LinkedIn. All I can, I could say no, I could say, oh no, I can't do that. It's just whatever, I don't feel comfortable doing that. But I would never hold it against a grant seeker if they ask me to do something and I can't do it. So just know that we are, here with you. We are not working against you. We really want to be able to see this work being done and see these communities being served. Um, and we try our best to be advocates for, for grantees. So it's just knowing that and recognizing that. I don't think you quite realize it until you're on the other side and see all oh, my colleagues at the trust. They've all worked in 
uh, nonprofit. Most of my colleagues, I say 99% of my colleagues outside the trust have worked in the nonprofit space. So it's something that we're all passionate about. I'll wait for the next question. So that's an interesting point you bring up because the power dynamic is real. It you is. Know, yeah. You are the ones holding the purses. Um, so I think that's an interesting point to just point out that, of course, at the end of the day, your people too, and a lot of the foundation program officers I know I haven't interacted with often do come from a nonprofit grant seeking background. So they've also had, you know, the worries of fundraising and going through that process. So they recognize that um, in when they're on the other side. I think an interesting point you brought up, Jen, is the fact, uh, you know, who has historically funded you and reigniting those conversations. A lot of times there's a lot of turnover, both on the foundation side and the nonprofit side. People leave, those relationships often leave with them. So do you have some tips on how to reignite those conversations? Is it as simple as just, you know, sending an email to Rachel and saying, hey, you know, we used to be funded by you five years ago, or do you have any other suggestions of how to do that? Maybe I'll start with you, Jen, but open it up to everyone. Sure, um, and I will say at a place like North Star Fund, this I get a lot of queries like this. People are like, you guys gave us our first grant in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> a few things, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's as straightforward as just because there was a pre-existing relationship, right? I think the question is, who are you now? Um, thankfully, in in quite a few circumstances in New York philanthropy, you do you can access information about what an or what the funding organization is funding. So you do want to get a sense of of is this a right outreach, right? One of the things that I find most um, perturbing about a lot of sort of rote development um, practice is just generating letters of inquiry, you know, on you know, like just sending out for sponsorship, like, like, don't waste the labor, use that time, I think, to think more strategically about relationships and do some research. Google is your friend, man, you can get a lot of information about what's going on, who's been funded. Look at what's funding peer organizations, like, all this information is public for a reason for you to use it. And then, as I said, it's maybe not the best thing for X person in an organization to do the cold call. There's maybe someone within the organization who held that relationship or who knew it or was a part of the original project. Like, I think there's a quite a bit of a little bit of pre-work that often needs to be done before you just, you know, blind. I get so many um, non-specific boilerplate emails saying, dear Jen, I mean, first of all, never spell my name J E N N, which if you do me, you would know. I'm right away like flag. <laughs> and then they'll just be like, "Do you know about you know? I'm I'm so pleased to write to you about this organization." And I and I'm like, "Why would you waste your time sending me this email when on our website it gives you like literally the three steps you need to reach out to us? Are all of our you know appointments everything you know? So there's a little bit of that. Like just don't waste your own time, um, but think a little bit and and. Tools like LinkedIn are extraordinarily useful for getting an understanding and building relationships right now. I know I'm that old. I'm recommending LinkedIn, but I am. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then also use, use some of the, 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 I mentioned before spaces like Nonprofit New York and others, but also use some of the resource mobilizing um, foundations because we have feet in both worlds. So spaces like New York Women's Foundation, Brooklyn Community Foundation, North Star Fund, we operate between the three of us, a number of convenings throughout the year. And it's quite representative of a bunch of different types of philanthropic entities and spaces of people who come to ours. And, and, and folks come knowing that they're potentially gonna meet prospective grantees in these spaces. In fact, um, years ago in the pre-COVID, and we're hoping to bring this back now, at North Star Fund, we actually even used to have an event before our annual gala, which was a workshop for smaller grantees to come mm. and learn how to fundraise at the gala. What's your elevator pitch? How do you introduce yourself? How do you talk in a really loud space really quickly about what you do, you know? So like, think about, you know, be creative about different places where you might be able to reignite relationships. Because I think what I've witnessed a lot of at North Star Fund events is someone will meet a program officer and say, oh my God, you guys funded us. You know, I'm saying, well, it wasn't my group. Well, then who do I talk to? Well, it's actually just my colleague. Oh, can we like connect? Over? Yeah, of course. You know, so it's just a lot of just trying to, it's like being in Encyclopedia Brown. It's like a little bit of like, I'm going to like figure out, I'm going to detective this relationship. And, uh, and you never know where, where it can lead you. 
Oh, uh, actually, this is going to go out in writing to you. It's my, Michael's uh, Baker's dozen of tips. Uh, and one is a common error that we do is we think of our work with foundations as transactional rather than relational. You know, I'm going to get the grant and then bye bye, uh, you know, and think, oh, I have to submit that report. And what we really need to think, keep in mind is we're developing relationships. Okay, so uh, board is a little unique, and I don't know how widespread it is in the um, philanthropic sector, but at four, our program officers are actually term limited. So after um, eight years, they turn out. So by default, that relationship ends. So a lot of the work actually to maintain that relationship, actually, we try to do on our side um, in, in making sure that, that those relationships continue. Um, the point that was brought up about convening is also a really important one because that's kind of one of, well, obviously, you know, people think of foundations and um, big funders like Ford, and they think about uh, their their biggest um, tool as the the money that they give out. But one one really big important tool that they also have is around convening, and so Ford does so many meetings all the time, all throughout the year, not just of their grantees, but of um, prospective grantees. And so those are often places where people can build those relationships and, and connections. Um, so that's just something that I wanted to add also. So but, oh, sorry. I just wanted to, um, continuing with the North Star um, example um, that Jen mentioned, uh, a relationship might be picking up the phone and saying, hey, you funded our, you were the first grant for our organization in 19, whatever it was, and, um, but you haven't funded us for a few years, so can we come in and talk again? And I just wanted to make the point that, you know, as Jen said, that's not always the most strategic approach. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is that the first, for me, the first rule of um, fundraising is do your homework. Do your homework. Do your homework. There are some foundations that see themselves as the first funder for an organization that's going to then go on to, you know, eventually diversify, grow, et cetera. And so for you to come to that program officer and say, hey, you funded us, you gave us our first grant in 1989, and now we're back. My, what I hear as a program officer is you haven't done your homework. You haven't done your homework, and that's not the way to make a good relationship. Um, I would also say that, um, oh gosh, I forgot. I was going to make a brilliant point in it. Just now. Don't come back. Don't come back. It'll come back. It'll come back. Um, Michael asked me also to remind people about the, the role that many foundations play in convening nonprofit organizations, whether grantees or not grantees. And so that's an important space like this space. But also, um, you know, as she mentioned, New York Foundation um, often has various kinds of convenings of organizations. New York Foundation is one of those foundations that tends to support young, emerging, smaller organizations. And so that's important to know. Um, there are some foundations that support large multi-service organizations that are super established and can get to scale and serve thousands and thousands of people. That's important to know. You know, that it's all of these things, all of these different layers of, um, of focus and strategy and priority are really, really important for, um, for you to know as you start trying to start a relationship, trying to begin a relationship with some uh, program officers. Do your homework, because if you don't, it comes across in a way that can be an instant turnoff and we'll just close that door before you even get a foot in. Um, so, and the trust also can be, does a lot of convening. Um, we often have um, special kinds of request for proposals, RFPs, and a function of those RFPs often is not just to make the grants, but also to create a kind of a learning community of organizations that are doing something similar, that are in some you know lane where they're um, trying to solve a problem or address a problem or an issue. 
in a common in a common way and so it kind of benefits them to often work together so those kinds of convenings just keep keep aware of and and keep your ear to the ground new york is a very i find it you know it's a very collegial place for nonprofit organizations it's also very competitive <laughs> but um people do get together and they talk and so uh, that's a good thing that's a, that's a really good thing to take advantage of and then there's all kinds of incredible resources like candid you know which is unbelievably um you know rich in terms of information about foundations so um so but do your homework mention the census mention quickly about what you do with the census so impressive. Oh, michael's saying i should talk about the census which he doesn't realize don't get me started on the census um, <laughs> um so i'm going to try and tamp it down but we one of my last roles at the trust was to um, chair the New York State Census Equity Fund. And so for the 2020 census, we brought together, we first, as, as Jen mentioned at uh, North Star, we often, uh, program officers and people in philanthropy are often community organizers of other people at foundations. And so for the New York State Census Equity Fund, um, the trust had to take on the role of organizing other funders throughout the state of New York and as you all know, I'm sure there's all kinds of interesting dynamics between the city of New York and the rest of the state. And so it was not easy. It was not easy to kind of break through some of the, the resistance that many people had. Um, but I learned an incredible amount about the state. I learned a lot about my counterparts at cities throughout the state in Buffalo and Rochester. There are community foundations in all of these places, some big, some small some urban, some rural. Um, and we also created a learning community of grantees that came together periodically to learn about effective strategies for reaching out and telling people how important the census was. And um, so it was a very a very worthwhile experience and um, can't wait for 2030. We're already actually gearing up and, and meeting and talking about 2030. One other thing I just wanted to mention, because I actually, before this, I was speaking to some coworkers just about what they would recommend in terms of building relationships. And to Pat's point, yes, do your homework, but at the same time, I think this is a given, but my coworker felt like I should mention it, mention it is just be professional. So if your staff person who's um, responsible for the project leaves, let us know. If the ED leaves, let us know. You know, if there's, um, if, if we ask for a report and you have trouble getting it to us, talk to us about what's going on because there have been so many times when we've had a really great relationship and a really great organization doing fantastic work. And then just like they go MIA and we don't know what's going on and it's very hard for us to advocate for them. So we understand obviously that the resources are strapped and the staff are overworked and there's a lot of just challenges in operating a nonprofit at this point in time. But just keep us in the loop and let us know what's going on and we can try to be as supportive as we can. But we need to know that information because if we're just getting like blocked emails, it's very, very hard for us to do our job. So it is seven. Um, so before we break into groups, I'm gonna ask one more question and then maybe we can do the group breakout. Um, the elusive multi-year general operating support grants. Mm -hmm. um, we saw, you know, philanthropy mobilize during COVID and those were a little more easy to get. And we saw, you know, funders moving very quickly to make sure their grantees were supported during that tough time. I think there's a little bit of fear now that we're out of the depths of COVID that funders will go back to their old ways. Are there any tips or recommendations or maybe some thoughts you could share about your fund you know, allocations going forward or any changes you're thinking about, um, and also just some general tips for getting that. Um, part of the fluidity we're seeing is there are actually two foundations in New York that do more than multi-year funding. One is the Sherman Foundation, S-C-H-E-R-M-A-N. Um, the second one is the Daphne Foundation, which is a foundation set up by Abigail Disney and her husband, Pierre Hauser, you just finished a cycle of seven year of grant support organizations. And it's so I think there, there's a beginning of, a, as I said, fluid change, but I hope those ideas will become more paramount and more accepting. 
<laughs> you had to tell everybody. <laughs> Twenty six more days. <laughs> Let it all out, Pat. It's all coming out now. <laughs> um, so the the Ford Foundation actually this this has been a a, a big topic of discussion at the Ford Foundation, and we. we as a foundation are making um, a real effort, a strategic decision to move more towards multi-year uh, general support grant making. Um, and I think one of the, the uh, real innovations that came out of the Port Foundation under the current uh, President Barron is our BUILD program, uh, which is actually uh, a program that provides um, really, really large multi-year general operating support grants to organizations that uh, Ford is trying to seed as kind of the, the next generation of, you know, Planned Parenthoods or, or ACLUs. Um, so uh, that, that kind of thinking behind that program has really kind of trickled down into um, the rest of Ford. So there, there really, there is a, there is a concerted effort to kind of move more towards um, multi-year general uh, support grant making because our philosophy when it comes to our grantee partners is that um, we, we really trust our grantee partners to know how best to use the funds. Like the grantee partners are the ones who are actually um, boots on the ground doing the work. And so um, we really kind of follow the lead of our grantee partners. And that is something that grant partners have said over and over and over again uh, is multi-year general operating support. So I'm, I'm happy about it. Yeah, it's, it's been there for a long yeah. time. Yeah. No. I'll do that. You want to do that one? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about the trust. We get this question a lot at New York Community Trust, and we talk about it a lot internally. So officially, the New York Community Trust does not do general operating support. Um, in my 20 plus years there, it never has. Um, but here's what we do. We are probably, we are one of the largest, if not the largest, um, philanthropic supporter of capacity building technical assistance. Mm -hmm. In my you know, experience, a lot of the push for general operating support is for money that's flexible enough that organizations can use it for capacity building. And so, although we don't, um, you know, build and incorporate general operating support into our grants, we are a very generous, I, I'm sorry if I sound like I'm bragging, but we're a hugely generous supporter of capacity building and technical assistance. And we're not, the kind of capacity building funder that only makes it available to our grantees. So we make it available to the nonprofit sector at large in general. Um, so that's one point I'd like to make. I'd also like to say that as the technical assistance program officer, and I know that Rachel shares this sentiment, I don't want to see a project budget or a, a proposal come in with a project budget that doesn't have a uh, accurate uh, and proportionate administrative slash overhead component oh, to sure. it. If I see a budget like that, I send it back. I say, you got to do this over again. We're not going to make a grant that doesn't account for and have a significant um, part of that grant helping contribute to the overhead of whatever that project might be. So that's a firm commitment that we that we make um, to all of our grantees. So, and we have a new president. So there might be some other changes, but that's not my job. Um, I wrote the first article on the importance of general support funding back in 1995. I guess no, even earlier. So I'm a supporter. I'm in the club. <laughs> but one of the things that you should be aware of is it's actually harder. To report on a general support grant than a project grant. 
Because a general support grant, you have to show, demonstrate the impact of the entire organization. <clears throat> and also, of course, how you're assessing it. Whereas a project grant, you're looking at what's the outcome of that project. So it, it's, whereas I think it's, uh, can I say mother's milk for all of us? Uh, but at the same time, it is it does create an extra layer of work. So mm -hmm. just, um, just want to add, uh, sorry, there's a little Velcro thing here that my shirt just yeah. <laughs> so it's very it's disturbing. Um, okay. Sorry. Um, just three tips that I would offer. One is, um, there, as everyone has said here, there's a very robust conversation happening within the field about the importance of multi year um, giving and general operating support. There are three sources that I would just recommend you kind of refer to a lot, like look at them and. Um, to be up to date on kind of what people are writing and talking about within the field. One is the Trust-Based Philanthropy Consortium website. Trust-Based Philanthropy is a sort of a national philanthropic coordinated project that is trying to organize funders to do things like provide more, um, I mean, obviously to provide more trust-based philanthropic, you know, relationship building. But one of the very practical things they're doing is trying to increase multi-year and general operations. There's a lot of testimonials, writings, sharings on that, trends, et cetera. Another place to look always, I think, for a more um, academic, but also like a, a sharp analysis about why this is so important is Nonprofit Quarterly, where there's been numerous articles written over the years across different types of fields about, about why multi-year uh, general operating support is so important. So it's like if you're trying to like find some like real seeds and gems. And then for those of us who are TikTok learners, you know, I know you all follow, probably follow Lula in some form or another, but he has done so many, just, you know, lists and simple breakdowns of how important it is, those are really good refreshers. So the reason why I suggest you kind of get to know this is then when you are in that mind frame, two things you have to do. Number one, you have to ask for multi-year support. About five years ago, my colleagues and I at North Star Fund, we decided, hey, what happened? What would happen if every time someone gave us a gift, we just answered them with, can you make that gift a five-year gift? Can you make that gift a three-year gift? Can you make it a two, right? Like, right, like, so, and, we have greatly increased our multi-year gifts beyond our wildest dreams, just merely by asking. And then saying, this is why we're asking. Um, it's both a sector demand, it's, and it's also incredibly, it's required for us to be able to make multi-year gifts. We can't make multi-year gifts and therefore seed fund and build sustainable grassroots organizations if you're not making multi-year gifts. And then the third thing that I would say is talk about it in your reporting and in your check-ins. What investments did you undertake? Oftentimes, I think we're a little bit nervous to talk about potential financial instability, but this is talking from a place of strength. We took your gift. We made an investment in the organization. We have brought on a stupendous team. We need this team to continue to grow. We do not want to have to reinvent this wheel the next time there's another crisis, another COVID, another Sandy, another Irene, another, right? So ask, just explain to them what your own five-year plan is and what sort of resources are required for that. And just get them into a shared mind frame and conversation about what it is that you're expecting and need to raise. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I think Michael, are we, should we break into groups? I think we're yeah, all we, um, we know you all have a lot of specific questions. So what we uh, invite you to do is Divide up the two tables or one or as one group and keep on. So we have first two here, three, four. So look and uh, turn your chairs to be able to face each other. And the uh, we up here will circulate among the groups. And you're uh, and of course you if you want to move to another group, uh, wonderful. There's a tremendous expertise. Rachel didn't mention her own background in assessment and evaluation, which is of course a May, a, may, a major topic as, as well. Um, so the uh, I think well the rest of you are pretty much all over the place in terms of different expertise and and Pat has the greatest seniority of having seen, been in the field 27 years. Uh, so does everybody can everybody do that then? Just stand up and turn around to the group behind the table. How many group got people on the side too, Michael? Oh. Got a lot of people yeah. on the side. Yeah. Do we want like you're going to form your own group. 
just love following instructions so quickly. I don't even know what the instructions are. I did. Maybe I can explain like on a count off. You can also do a count off, but then like I think they already know. Already become a are we included? Yeah, we should. That's a problem. We should try to put it online. Should we do the online? Should one of us stay with online? Here or something. Oh, okay. so you, that's so you take, uh, take it to you the yeah. Yeah. There, one, two, three, four, five. Oh my God. I didn't see you here. Okay. We would have introduced you. Silly. Came here just to catch up. We were very impressed. You like coordinated. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and, and you're also on our resource list. So what do we need? What do we need? Yeah. 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 Should I go? Yeah. 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 I got my accent. Oh, I was saying I, I came here just to be I, able I to say hi to you guys. Hi, I don't know yet. We're working on a maybe a consulting. <laughs> I have to tell you, sounds so much like me. Because we're Bruce. Because I'm doing this after doing this similar thing. Because I'm. So, so, and so, I'm, I have had my board, and like, you must be kidding. And I'm like, funding my other. First, I told you, June of 2024. Now it seems like it's going to be more June 2023. But, you know, you, yeah, you kind yeah, of. I have to, I have to find to and get it. But I also want to see my father. Is set up, but you know, is it, yeah. so, so, you want to be so, no, but, I, but I know there's such like and everything over your constituency, and therefore, so you're, so you're always operating with the deficit. Find someone else to fund that balance, yeah. and so, so this idea, yeah. So I remember when I made a spell up. Yeah, yeah. 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 supposed to be going through and talking, but should I? Maybe I'll right. But I'm managing. Um, a, a colleague of mine there, and he said, "It's like don't like that question exactly." It's like it's it's not it's it's the paradox of of well it's it just like it's not yeah. 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 I still get I know, I know. I've been with us since right, on the right. Foundation Center since so about 95. So it's very, very, very interesting. Everybody else can do it. So, we're getting in our organization. Yeah, I don't know. Is there any hope? Yes. How are they? 